Good afternoon, everyone. This is a joint uh, session of Senate uh, Finance and Appropriations and House um, Appropriations and House Ways and Means. So there's quite a large group of legislators here to uh, listen to an update from Congressman Welch. We're so happy that he's able to uh, join us today and give us a briefing. Um, and I know that your schedule is crazy and that you might have to leave for a vote, but we're more than happy to have you come for as much time as you can give us to um, help us understand all that's going on and particularly as it relates to the um, latest financial relief bill and what it uh, means uh, potentially to the state of Vermont. So with that, um, I don't know what screen, I'm just gonna put you on as the speaker um, um, and let you take it from here if you are ready to do that. Are, are you there? Um, I, I'm here. Oh, great. Oh, there you are, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm gonna let you, uh, they, everybody wants to hear you, not me. So well, welcome, Peter, and uh, so glad to have you. Well, actually I was on early uh, when you were giving your intro and I won some of those cream puffs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We could, use, we could use some cream puffs down here. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> now that, <laughs> actually the chair of our appropriations committee, what the wonderful Rose of the world, um, uh, it, uh, is is a cream puff uh, fan as well, so I'm going to pass that on. Uh, uh, Senator Kitchell, uh, thank you. And I see Senator Ballant is here, our uh, Senate President, uh, first woman to run the Senate. You know, you guys got a chance of getting something done between uh, the Appropriations Chair and the Senate President. Uh, 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 all our money chairs are. Um, women. Well, I mean, they're not in good hands. What can yeah. you say? Uh -huh. that's, 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 pretty, that's pretty good. Yep, Senator Cummings, my old chair. I see her right there. Uh, and of course, the mayor. Uh, you know, it's just so, I'm, I'm stuttering around here because I'm, I'm so happy to see you. It, it's really, really wonderful uh, to, to be with uh, my old colleagues. Uh, that I, I've served 13 years in the state house, and um, honestly, uh, when I think about my uh, work here and my work there, the intimacy of the relationships uh, in the state house, uh, the fact that everybody uh, has to do their own work, uh, that you actually have to work it out with face-to-face uh, -face or Zoom-to-Zoom -zoom interactions, uh, there's an enormous benefit to that. Hard as it is. Uh, to be doing all that work. Uh, there's something that's very intimate, both in uh, my memory of the interactions I had with many of you as we try to work out the best path forward. Um, and also just that connection you have with the voters that you represent. It's, uh, it's really, really extraordinary. And when you're in the midst, when you're in the midst of it in the hurly burly, sometimes uh, it's easy to forget that. Uh, easier to remember who you're mad at for what, <laughs> what they just did. But you're going to look back uh, at this extraordinary time where you had to help guide Vermont through a once in a century event. Um, and more work continues. For, this began a year ago. And uh, I remember coming back to Vermont after we passed one of our first bills. And the governor had just declared the state of emergency. And I might have told the story before. It just showed we were in a different world. I was on my way out to uh, Reagan National Airport to fly back to Vermont on the 10 o'clock uh, flight. And uh, I got a call in the car. It was American Airlines. This is when American Airlines used to fly three times a day back and forth between Burlington and Washington. And, um, the, call, the, the, the person said, uh, Congressman Welch, are you still planning on taking the flight and going to Burlington? And I said, well, yes, I'm on my way. And they said, well, as soon as you get here, we're ready to leave. I was the only person on that big plane. That's how much <clears throat> our economy just went into shock when the decision was made that the threat of this uh, pandemic was so severe 
And of course, that was a year ago. Now we're here today. And of course, we just passed the 500,000 mark of real people in Vermont and all around the country who died as a result of this. Uh, so it's been pretty devastating. And then, of course, you guys have had to deal not just with the uh, proper response uh, in the healthcare uh, element of this that's really brutal, but just the economic pain and the anxiety uh, that parents feel when they're worried about their kids, their health, worried about school, trying to get schools back open, uh, trying to keep your downtowns and your, com your community centers together. Um, I see Senator Westman trying to help with our farmers that are already laboring under incredibly low milk prices and have to deal with this. Uh, so there's an immense human factor here, not to mention exhaustion uh, that all of us have, I think, of being uh, just disrupted from our normal routine and uh, uh, in our ability to interact with our friends and with our family. I mean, just think about the Thanksgivings and the Christmases and how the Hanukkah, all the holidays that we had, it's really taken a toll. And I, I'm saying this to you because I, I feel confident about how you all are doing your job. And what's so important about the job, we've got to get the policies right. We've got to get the resources back to the state, <clears throat> but there has to be a communication from political leaders of confidence, of directness, uh, of, of steadfastness, uh, and respect and empathy, because we need, each of us needs that. We need to convey it when we have a position of public trust uh, so that Vermonters have confidence in our institutions and have the capacity with solidarity to get, continue to get through this. So I, I just want to say that to you as a citizen of Vermont, uh, that I really respect and value uh, the challenge that you're facing and how you're chasing, uh, facing it. It really, really makes a difference. And you're going to look back uh, at this extraordinary time where you can't be face to face. It's very frustrating. I'm in a similar situation. Most of our committee work is on, on the equivalent of Zoom. It's very frustrating to me that I can't interact with my colleagues, but it's the way we have to do it for now. Now, the good news is, there's two pieces of good news. One is we've got the vaccine and we didn't know we'd have it a year ago. I think Dr. Fauci was thinking maybe sometime this winter we'd get a vaccine <clears throat> and it's been accelerated. So that's really good news and you're getting it distributed. Um, so we know the end is in sight. The second, I think, piece of good news is that in fact, there has been at the federal level, a very substantial economic response uh, that has been uh, a lifeline to mitigate, but not eliminate the incredible dislocation that we're experiencing in our economy. And saying that in a general sense is not to uh, disregard the specific pain, particularly folks who uh, run restaurants or a performance space like the Flynn or uh, Catamount Arts. Uh, these organizations that are in our communities that are so essential to the well being uh, and the vitality of local life. So uh, that's the, that's, 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 but it's good news that we have had a federal response. Um, and I think that in the CARES package, you know, so far about $4.8 billion has come to Vermont, some uh, that you've managed some in the form of checks to individuals, some in the form of unemployment compensation, uh, some in the form of the uh, payroll protection plan that helps small businesses keep, keep people on the payroll. That has really made a difference. Just think about where we would be if we hadn't had that help uh, come back to Vermont. Um, we in Washington, me, Pat, Patrick and Bernie have been advocating very, very fiercely that the money that does come to Vermont, especially through the state, that you have a lot of flexibility. Uh, I really do believe on the basis of my experience sitting in uh, your uh, seats during the 13 years I served in the state Senate, uh, that uh, the House, the Senate and the governor have a much better uh, handle on how best to allocate those resources. So 
the flexibility that you've been advocating um, to me and to Bernie and Patrick that you have, we've been advocating here. Uh, the uh, CARES package had less flexibility uh, than we liked, but we, uh, in the last December package, uh, got the deadlines extended later than I would have liked because you know, you'd already had to make decisions on the basis of the law as it was then. So that's just by way of introduction to what's up now. Uh, on Friday, <clears throat> I'm going to be voting here in the House on a $1.9 trillion supplemental package. Uh, and I think you probably from joint fiscal from, uh, from Steve and Catherine and others uh, have the outlines of that. So I won't go through it in super detail, but the bottom line here is that one, it's very significant, uh, the amount of money. And that's based on uh, the view of economists that, uh, uh, that, that our economy is very fragile and the future is uncertain. And it's better to err on the side of doing a, a little bit more than it is to err on the side of doing too little. And the rationale for that is that with the combination of vaccines, then the, the, the potential, the likelihood that when we get fully vaccinated, we get to herd immunity, the economy is in a position to have a self-sustaining recovery. But if as we're crossing that bridge, you know, we're on one side of the river now, walking across that bridge to the vaccine, we've got to have economic aid so we don't leave people and businesses uh, behind when we get to a fully vaccinated uh, country. We've got to continue to provide help to individuals. We've got to continue to provide help to states and localities. And we've got to continue to provide help to folks who've lost their jobs. 10 million are still lost or are, are out of work from uh, pre-pandemic uh, levels. So this 1.9 trillion, the elements in it, as you know, are uh, for specifically directly for COVID for vaccine, make certain that we get the vaccine uh, vaccines to you and that the federal government, not the state government pays the cost of that. Uh, supplemental support for the efforts to do the mitigation, uh, the contact tracing, um, the surveillance uh, that's part of the public health response. There's money with individual checks. Uh, so Vermonters will, many will get $1,400 checks that will obviously be uh, helpful to them in meeting their expenses. Uh, there's money in there to help reopen our schools. There's an expense associated with that. Uh, it's really, really tough uh, to open schools because they've got to be open safely. And that requires that the schools make some adjustments in uh, the physical space. Uh, sometimes it affects personnel. So there's money in there with the expectation that that'll be utilized to help get our schools uh, open and open safely. I think we all, all, all want those schools open. The kids need it and the parents need it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we'll continue unemployment benefits for folks who are about to lose it on March 14th. Okay, and those are folks who really have been hit hard because uh, <clears throat> they lost their job or they really lost a lot of hours as a result of COVID. And we can't leave them high and dry. We have things in uh, for rental assistance and Vermont's been doing a great job on that. <clears throat> and our hope is that there'll be maximum flexibility so that the way you can use that money is to best respond to the concrete needs of Vermonters who are without income and can't pay their rent. Um, a big provision in there that obviously is gonna engage uh, you uh, for this session <clears throat> is the $960 million in aid that will come to Vermont in the House bill um, uh, for state and local aid. And this bill has, uh, under that bill, you, the state of Vermont would get about $600 uh, million and our local communities would get about 300 million. <clears throat> this legislation has a lot more flexibility than we had in the original CARES package. In fact, with our municipalities, they'd have some flexibility to say partner with a local food shelf or with a local nonprofit uh, to try to help the citizens in that community uh, <clears throat> meet the, the needs that are defined. You know, I see Bob Helm on here. 
And I know how much you've been involved in local affairs and I know how much you believe in local control. Well, I think there'd be a lot of flexibility here with the money that goes to community for the local officials to make uh, the decisions and also to partner with some local organizations that were trusted <clears throat> to help meet the needs of citizens. So I, I'm very strongly in favor uh, of this legislation. Uh, and I see my job here, and I think Bernie and Patrick agree, that our job is to try to get the resources back to the people of Vermont and to the Governor and General Assembly of Vermont uh, for you then to do that hard work of implementation in those micro decisions that are so essential to the wise <clears throat> and productive use of the funds that are gonna come to help us get through COVID. So you have an incredible, incredible responsibility because this money that comes, it's not for free. You know, at some point this money's gonna have to be repaid. The decisions, we've made a decision here that the, the circumstances require us to borrow it <clears throat> to mitigate the harm. Uh, but we're gonna be successful based on the, the practical micro decisions that you make as a general assembly pardon me, on how best to use this money. So uh, I, uh, I, I'm going to stop here. <clears throat> but with, with the, just tell you the timeline. We're voting on the, in the House on Friday. <clears throat> pardon my cough. We're voting on the House on Friday. And then the Senate is going to begin their process. And it's going to be that reconciliation process where it'll take basically 50 votes plus one in order to get it. And the goal is to have it done by March 14th. So why don't I stop there, uh, Madam Chair, and turn it back to you and open it up for questions. All right. Um, thank you. Um, please, uh, <laughs> I hope you're just um, in need of water and that you're not um, coming down with something. We need you there in your vote. Um, so uh, March, March 14th is what you think. You need would some be of those cream puffs. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I would I would bring them to you directly, but I might have to arrange with Senator Starr's trucking company to get them to you. Um, so I I'm going to have to have people put their hands uh, up so I can see on the bar um, if who would like to ask the first question. Um, why don't I give the committee chairs the opportunity? So um, Senator. Um, Cummings, and then um, if you have a question, and then I'll move to um, Senator, uh, to Representative Ansel and uh, Representative Hooper, and then we'll open it up to, I, I see we have Senator Pearson uh, has a hand up. And um, so uh, uh, Senator Cummings, do you have a question at this point? Or if not, uh, we'll move on. Okay. No, I'm fine for now. I'm still in listening mode. All right, thank you. Um, Representative Ansel. Thank you. Um, so my only question has to do with the money that's going to county government and what kind of flexibility um, is there in the act uh, currently and is it possible um, for us to be able to, since we don't really have a much of a county government in Vermont, if there's a, how or what you would suggest to us. Well, uh, Janet, that's been an issue down here that we've been trying to work out. A lot of the New England states don't have much of a county government, so uh, but a lot of the rest of the country does. Um, and it, it, what we're trying to have is a basically a formula where it'll get down to our municipalities and to our smallest towns. <clears throat> and that's got to be part that we believe that's got to be part of the distribution formula so that it will be determined in advance. The flexibility, I think, right now is quite substantial. You know, we have different situations for different towns. Some towns have had greater expenses associated with COVID than others. And the money is supposed to be spent for COVID-related expenses. <clears throat> but I had mentioned early on, that I think one of the things that will be flexible, I mean, let's say Bob Helm uh, in his town, they could partner with a local food shelter or a local uh, organization 
that is doing something, providing some services to folks who were adversely impacted by, <clears throat> by, the, by COVID. So the flexibility extends not just to how you use the money, it is supposed to be COVID related, but how you uh, partner with others that are assisting many of our small towns that don't have an infrastructure to set up for the distribution of funds. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, move on then. Um, Representative Hooper. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Welch, uh, for, for all that you are doing for us. It, it has already made a tremendous difference. The flexibility is um, particularly important. So thank you for focusing on that. Um, I, I, I am curious about the focus, not just on responding to COVID or the pandemic, but I, I hope that there will be room for how we move out of the pandemic and to be able to make investments that uh, help us recover more fully from this and help us recover in kind of the new Vermont as opposed to the old way that we used to do business. And well, you know, um, first of all, congratulations on uh, assuming the, uh, chair, the chair position. Uh, there's two things, all right? Number one, the COVID packages are really intended to help cope with COVID. And the consequences of COVID are, not, are health, but also economic. <clears throat> so the money is supposed to be related uh, to COVID expenses. And, and as I mentioned, that can be somewhat broadly defined, but it should be COVID related. And, uh, you know, all of us in Vermont have seen how extensive the COVID impacts are. But this is not a, an alternative for say an infrastructure plan or an education bill that we might be considering things uh, that would be necessary for us to do <clears throat> independent of COVID. So that I think is the, the broad parameter. And obviously there's gonna be a lot of gray area and there has to be judgment used. But the bottom line here is this is where I think you all have enormous uh, responsibility uh, to Vermont because <clears throat> are you going to do things that can be durable? You know, what decisions do you make? Is it going to just be short term or longer term? And how you do that in a way that responds to COVID, but also has a benefit beyond COVID. And this is why I am so much in favor of flexibility is that you can make those decisions better than, than, than Patrick, me and Bernie down here. Okay, that, that really is your job. So uh, I'm doing all I can to get you maximum flexibility, but it's not flexibility that allows you to do anything you feel like, all right? It's gotta be your good judgment applied to how you're addressing the COVID related impacts uh, and do it in a way that provides the maximum longer term benefit for Vermonters. That's our challenge. Um, I have Senator Pearson followed by uh, Representative Feltus and then uh, Senator Brock. So Senator Pearson, you're next. Thank you, um, Congressman, nice to see you. And, and uh, Hi, Chris. Uh, <clears throat> I'll need to heap praise on you, but I think, I hope you already know the first uh, recovery bill has made a world of difference and uh, you know really kept us going and kept state revenue going right. in a very, very important way. Um, as you talk about the next bill, we've also heard that money <clears throat> would be coming directly to schools. And I wonder if, if you have any details to share there, is, it, is that part of the local money that you described or the state money or is that something separate coming down coming down the pike at another time because, you know, and, and I would also just add, I guess it is COVID related, but helping our schools and our students recover from the myriad challenges that the pandemics brought is not a one-time thing. So I'd love, I'd love to understand any details you have and could comment on. Well, there is, there is money in here to help reopen schools. 
Okay, so there'll be some flexibility on that. Um, I'm not quite sure how that gets distributed, whether it goes through <clears throat> the legislature, it goes directly to schools, but I think, I think you're gonna have a role in that. But there is, and it, there's a recognition that if we're gonna open schools and we're gonna do it safely, it's gonna, there's gonna be expenses associated with that. <clears throat> you know, I went to Winooski uh, when they were open. I just saw how extensive the, ch the changes they had to make. They had personnel outside, people taking temperatures. Uh, they had to have a lot of uh, spacing within their classes. Uh, they had students separated much more. They had to have uh, uh, more room and you could see there was a greater demand on personnel. And a lot of those things, the practical implementation is such a challenge. You know, and that's in addition to dealing with the concerns parents have, will let my kids get sick, will they, will they bring home the virus? It's, it's the, in addition to the concern that teachers have about their own safety. So <clears throat> there are expenses, but uh, I think it's money that's gonna go through the legislature, but it's definitely included in this package to help address the expenses associated uh, with COVID, Chris. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Feltis? Yes, thank you very much, Congressman, for being here and, and for all of the help you've given us in the past. We all uh, have worked very hard on the two bills that we've received so far, trying to be as flexible and as strategic as we can. And I, I appreciate that this new batch of uh, aid, as you say, needs to be related to COVID expenses. And I think we all have lots of places where we think that can be appropriately applied. I wonder, however, if you can comment on the likelihood that we have heard that there might be a piece in this bill that would have a much broader impact in terms of raising the minimum wage universally across the country. Um, that obviously it has a much broader impact rather than just direct uh, support or just direct recovery from the pandemic. Can you give us an idea of how likely you think that might be? <clears throat> Well, I expect that that will be included in the House bill. So I think it will be part of what I vote on and I will vote for that uh, on Friday. In the Senate, as you know, they're talking over there about a so-called reconciliation process. Now we're getting into legislative arcana with a, with a bunch of geeky legislators. <laughs> you know, second reading, third reading, motion to recommit, all that stuff, right? So in the Senate, uh, the filibuster means it's you've got to get a super majority to get anything done. A, a way around that procedurally is you have used the reconciliation process, and then it's 50 votes plus one. And in the Senate, uh, um, the parliamentarian who used to work for Senator Leahy, she's the parliamentarian, but she is going to have to make a decision as to whether uh, including the minimum wage is uh, in violation or in compliance with the Byrd rule whatever that is, all right? <laughs> I mean, um, so uh, outcome uncertain. I think it'll minimum wage will be included uh, in, the, in the House bill. Uh, the, the, in the Senate bill, it's, a, it's very divisive. Uh, the Democrats in the Senate support the minimum wage by and large, although Joe Manchin doesn't. And, you know, he'd be, any one of them can, the Republicans oppose it. So, and we don't know what the parliamentarian has to say. So I can't predict that outcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just curious. And I know that there's a phase in, but um, I, that's a level of detail that we can look at later. Well, because five, it is a five-year phase in. You know, keep in mind, it's like when we did it in Vermont, there was a phase in. Of course, in Vermont, when we did the minimum wage, this is actually the last time, I don't know if it was the last time, but when we did it, when I was there with Governor Douglas, we put in a, uh, a cost of living adjustment as well. So that, you, you know, you've got this absurd situation federally where in effect, we really don't have a minimum wage. Minimum wage is $7 and 25 cents. That's $14,000 a year for somebody working full time. I mean, that, we just don't have a minimum wage. So what it should be and how it should be phased in and what its impact is on some of our, our businesses. Those are things that we always had to debate in Montpelier when we were considering the minimum wage increase. Uh, but down here, uh, we haven't had that debate for over a decade. So we've essentially abandoned any commitment to a federal minimum wage. Uh, 
but though it, it is a five-year phase in uh, change. Um, we have uh, Senator Brock and then Representative Harrison after that. So Senator Brock. Great, well, thank you again very, very much. Uh, <clears throat> share my colleagues' uh, enthusiasm uh, with your being here today and with the help that you've been to us uh, th throughout this process. Uh, as, as you know, uh, one of the things that we've learned from the COVID uh, epidemic is the importance of communications and particularly telecommunications. Right. Uh, the presence of it has helped, the absence of it uh, has not. And we, we have this tendency of almost uh, becoming two Vermonts, one rural and one uh, urban. With the funds that we've gotten from the CARES Act, one of the biggest problems has been the stricture in terms of having to essentially spend the money and spend it now, as opposed to doing things that are more long-term in nature. And as a result, it's limited what we could do. Uh, do you have any hope that in the current bills that there would be more of a long-term focus to help us do things that are good for fixing the problems we've had with COVID, but also have a longer, uh, a longer life, and also to be able to use funds that can be leveraged rather than simply spending them outright that could be leveraged in providing either guarantees, uh, building up reserves or reserve funds for organizations like VITA to use or uh, in subordinated debt or other almost semi-equity positions that could be leveraged with the private sector so that we can take the government money we have and use it more effectively and with more of a long-term view in mind. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I do, uh, Randy, thank you for that. Um, my preference is that you get as much flexibility as possible. This bill is gonna have much more flexibility than was in the CARES Act, all right? But the flexibility still has some constraints in that it's about COVID. Now, there's a lot of gray area because for instance, you mentioned the, the broadband. We have to have broadband, okay? And we need it now so people can get healthcare so they can go to school and so people can work, right? And the two Vermonts you're talking about where some have broadband and some don't, we need it now. Now, if we use COVID money to help on broadband, that's not gonna just have a benefit right now, that's gonna have a benefit for the long term. So that's an area where I could see the broadband money that's in there, that is focused mainly on schools and hotspots as, as, as being beneficial to deal with COVID, but also being beneficial to build Vermont into a stronger community. So you're gonna be wrestling with some of that because there's gray area, but much more flexibility than you've had in the past. On the other hand, my expectation is after we do this COVID bill, we're gonna get into an infrastructure bill. And I know all of you know that we really need to do something about our infrastructure and the states need some federal help. And that's been a bipartisan uh, point of view for a long time. And part of an infrastructure bill has to be the commitment to uh, wiring, to getting high-speed internet throughout America. And my view, and this has become much more bipartisan since COVID, is that we've got to have really high quality, high-speed internet in rural areas. And we've got a future proof. We don't want to give second string uh, internet to rural areas because it's better than what they have only to see the technology leap ahead, but for rural areas to be stagnant. So I do think there's gonna be, on, on this question of, of, uh, of internet, there's gonna be another legislate, another bill that is not COVID related, it's internet related, and I hope will be extremely ambitious. Now, this question of the public-private partnerships, I always think it makes sense to be trying to figure out how do you best leverage the resources you have? Um, and this is, again, uh, you know, you have some things in mind, perhaps, but we certainly don't have them in mind here about how that would work in Franklin County. You know, what could you do um, combining local initiative with some federal money? Um, but my preference would be to give you as much flexibility to be creative on that as possible. Bottom line here is you've got to have accountability. You can't be wasting money. And there's a huge risk of some fraud. We saw in California 
uh, a lot of money being stolen out of uh, some of the unemployment system. Uh, you know, we don't have that big a problem in Vermont. Uh, but as long as we have accountability, the purpose has to be to help you deal with COVID. And if you can do it in a way that is going to provide some long-term benefit, great. That's fantastic. Um, we have uh, Representative Harrison um, next. You there, great. Jim? Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, Congressman, it's good to see you again. Uh, I have a similar question uh, that Senator Brock had, uh, not on broadband, which is uh, certainly very important, but um, we all um, or became painfully aware and, and our constituents um, became even more painfully aware that we have a uh, legacy computer system for our unemployment. And um, we could you know, certainly COVID related. It's uh, the economic well-being of uh, many, many Vermonters uh, depend on that. And when the system can't handle the additional traffic, um, a lot of people suffer or wait. Um, and, you know, so we could all argue that it's COVID related. However, to fix it and invest in a new system, you know, it takes several years. Uh, so, you know, it would be we would be looking in the rearview mirror, hopefully, on the pandemic. Um, but we fixed it for the next uh, uh, issue and certainly day to day. Um, any idea or guidance as to whether or not uh, that kind of investment would be applicable to uh, the funds, federal funds in the yeah. current stimulus bill? <clears throat> um, Jim, I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is that the computer system we have in Vermont and just how antiquated it is, that's replicated all across the country. Uh, you know, our, our unemployment system <clears throat> is ancient. It just doesn't deal uh, with sort of modern uh, employment patterns, including part-time work, uh, contingent labor, uh, gig economy, all of these things that really are part of the economic reality, uh, the unemployment system, not just the infrastructure of this computer system, but uh, uh, the eligibility criteria and so on, all have to be revamped. And there's an effort down here to really try to do that. Uh, you know, in, in the unemployment benefits really widely vary uh, from state to state. That's one question. The other thing is that pre-pandemic, if you were a, a, a self-employed person or a gig economy, or you were a Vermonter who plowed driveways uh, uh, in the winter and did landscaping in the summer, uh, you lost all your income. You, you, you weren't eligible for unemployment. You, you just couldn't, you couldn't get it. So we need to build the computer infrastructure and I support that whether we can, you can use the money that comes to the state to do that, I don't know, but it'd be, from my perspective, a wise use of some funds. Uh, but if it's not then, then that's a looming issue where we have to help the states out with modernizing the infrastructure. I mean, by the way, I just wanna say this, it was so heartbreaking for me, and I know for you, when we passed this legislation, this was early on in the pandemic, with that $600 supplement, it really made a difference for people. And I know some employers had some issues with that, but we passed it. And then people were wondering where it is and they didn't get the check and they needed it, they had rent due. And that's so frustrating as a legislator to pass some legislation and then it gets held up for like bureaucratic reasons and people are counting on it. And it erodes people's confidence uh, in their government. So we've got to fix that. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, I have a question from uh, Representative Iacovone. David? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Y you may have addressed this, and if you did, I apologize. D do you anticipate there will be a date certain by which money to states and localities might have to be spent? Um, I'm not seeing that right now. We had that in the CARES package and then we amended it in the December bill. And that was my legislation along with some others that did that. 
This legislation is giving you much more flexibility. So the constraint is it's gotta be somewhat, it's gotta be COVID related in, in a flexible way. Uh, but uh, I don't think we have a time certain where you've got to spend the money. You know, it, it doesn't make sense to spend it because there's an artificial deadline looming, when in fact you might get a lot more bang for your buck if you decide to uh, to do it in, in, in next March instead of uh, next uh, October. Thank you. Uh, let's hope it stays that way. Um, uh, other questions or yeah, I don't I have see one thing. All right, um, Senator Starr. And then yeah, um, yeah. Senator Pearson is again, I think, after you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter, for being with us today. Certainly appreciate oh. it. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, uh, as you know, I've worked many years on ag issues, local foods, uh, promoting all of that. What, do you think the money that's coming to the schools, say, would help in the food part of the school business, uh, say with universal meals, uh, buying local. And I don't know if you've heard this yet, but <clears throat> we have in Vermont dropped under 600 dairy farms. So we're getting, there's more land being opened up uh, where we could grow more food and crops. And I'm wondering if, if the state money is coming just in general money to us, or is it gonna get some divided up uh, like schools, uh, uh, state government, including all the departments, or will there be some specific for, for certain businesses yeah. like ag or, you know, or not? Um, Bobby, this is where, first of all, I'm really sad about the bridge fire, that beautiful bridge in Troy. I'm really sorry. To, right. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was a sad day. Oh, my God, it was. I think I crossed that a few times with uh, Uncle Jack. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Something. Um, there's, there's significant food assistance in here. Right. And you guys know that a lot of Vermonters are hungry. And it's invisible. It's really heartbreaking. Many of you have probably been to some food distribution sites where the lines are incredibly long, people showing up who've never had to go to uh, get help with food before. Um, so there's money in this to uh, provide further food assistance. Um, there's not specific money for the farms, but the flexibility that you had, I know you included uh, some money for, uh, for our farms uh, uh, out of the allocation that went to the state before. So yes. I would think you'd be able to do that again. Uh, the topic you're talking about, Bobby, you know, how do we revitalize our ag economy, obviously is crucial now with the further relentless pressure on our dairy farms. So um, I want to say thank you. I, uh, uh, Jane, I'm going to they, just, they call votes and we're doing, okay. we, we do our votes in a rolling uh, uh, routine. You know, we socially distance down here. Um, so my, I'm, I'm W, so I'm at the end, but we're getting towards the end. Okay. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Senator Bray, you have one quick question and then we no. will let you get, we don't want you to miss your vote, obviously. And if you have to leave, you have to leave. So um, Senator Bray. Sure, I'll jump right in. Um, uh, good afternoon, Peter. Great to see you. Thanks Hi, for all yeah. your, your help. Um, you know, we, we've talked about, and I think you have as well, the whole notion the pandemic revealed a lot of strains that were already inherent in the system, but maybe masked uh, until the pandemic showed them to us all the more clearly. One of those things is energy burden and energy poverty. And we're really looking in Vermont to build stronger programs to address climate change and the costs associated with energy. So I know that there's been a lot of discussion around things like a Green New Deal. I don't know if you can say anything briefly about what the opportunities for Vermont uh, might be to uh, make uh, progress uh, working with uh, the delegation in your office. Well, it, it's, it, that's obviously an incredibly important uh, question. And I think if we do it right, it, provide some economic opportunity as well as environmental benefit. 
But the COVID package is not focused on that. I mean, right. some of that money may be available to help uh, retrofit schools. It may be things that could result in uh, uh, efficiency, and, you know, more efficient uh, buildings is really part of how we're going to get greenhouses down. And I, I, I think I recall uh, that uh, some of the money, I guess you've got a budget item that is going to increase weatherization funds uh, significantly. But I don't think that this COVID package uh, will be addressing the, those very, very important concerns directly. Okay. So I, I do apologize uh, that I've got to go across the street. No, please, um, okay. please. Uh, we appreciate your time and thank you for being with us today, um, Peter. It's always good to hear from you. No, and uh, we're, you know, we're, we are available like whenever you want us, okay? Because you have the hard work the decisions you make are going to be felt by Vermonters for a generation or more. And uh, you're doing it under very difficult circumstances. So to the extent I can ever be even minimally helpful, uh, we're here. And, you know, I'm on the clock now. So this is not an imposition. All right. Thank Thanks you. Guys. Thank you, Congressman. Bye-bye.